Greg Rand, Chief Strategy Officer of Renters Warehouse, Steve Katz, Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of Residential Financing at Arbor Realty Trust, and Brian Murphy, Senior Vice President of Residential Financing at Arbor Realty Trust, are here today sharing thoughts on flipping real estate property, short-term and bridge financing, and new and interesting prop tech, among other topics from the IMN Single Family Rental Forum West in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's part of Arbor Realty Trust's IMN Conference Recap. I'm Betsy Kim, Assistant Vice President of Editorial Content at Arbor. To our guests, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Thank you. So what's the landscape for the SFR market for flipping properties? I think flipping properties is unnatural. I think it goes against the essence of single-family homes. I think you're taking an asset class that you can be taxed as capital gains, and instead you're selling it too fast and you're going to pay ordinary income. I think you're buying an asset that's supposed to appreciate, but you're selling it before it does. So I get flippers mad at me whenever I'm asked. Flipping single-family homes is a very noisy aspect of the residential real estate market because all the TV shows on Bravo are about that. All the seminars that come to town that want to teach you how to get rich quicker about that. But I ask every flipper that I meet, what would have happened if you kept half the houses you flipped? And they have this funny look over their, that comes over their face when they realize they'd be retired by now if they had done that. Steve, what's your view? I'll try to take a different view, although I, I share a lot of the sentiment that Greg shared. I would say institutionally, it's an extraordinarily difficult business. While you know why it's on TV is because it's exciting. They get rich quick. It's been on TV since the honeymooners were there. There's always a scam, and this wasn't a scam. It was a function of, of the financial crisis where there was such depression in the absolute cost and a lack of liquidity. So if you had the cash to buy it, you could get it. There was no lending. There was no financing prospects. If you could buy quick, Quick, you were able to turn around and perhaps sell and make very handsome profits. What I would say is I would advise anyone interested in flipping to really understand property management and renting first, because when you get to the finish line, there may not be a shiny piece of tape to run through. Meaning you should really think about, I want to be in the single family space. What is the value of that home? One option could be the buyer. Another option could be a stream of cash flows from renting it. A third could be property manager, if you could grow that sector of your business as well, and then have a long-term view. But solely focused on flipping is getting less and less common because the market has balance to it. I mean, people are recognizing the true value. There's a ton of liquidity in the market. There's a lot of financing opportunities. So it becomes challenging. On a one-off basis, sure, there's always an opportunity. Oftentimes, it's in foreclosure sales or near foreclosure sales. But in the aggregate, I think you'll see more renting as you go forward, it would be very difficult to make a living flipping. And Brian, do you have added thoughts? Borrowers or investors need to be cognizant of their market. I think that first and foremost is they have to understand their market. They have to source their opportunities smartly. I think the easy flips where the easy money days, I think, are kind of behind us as far as buying a property, putting some lipstick, i.e. paint and carpet, and then moving on and making some good money there. Those opportunities are waning. So I think first and foremost, you really got to understand your market, be aware of your own abilities, and be cognizant of the pitfalls, and your property management if you were to hold on to it. Can you describe the short-term and bridge financing options available for SFR portfolio investors? I kind of see the short-term bridge. That's uh, one and the same. The differentiation is in years past, it was more about just kind of financing the acquisition of the homes. That was in a time period where there was more readily available opportunities for the easy flip. Come in, put, uh, you know, the lipstick flip, i.e. do a little paint and carpet, moderate rehab budget. As, as those opportunities decrease, to be successful at the fix and flipping, you have to be, I think, willing to uh, create more value. You create that value through moderate to significant rehab. The market has kind of is evolving to uh, offer uh, rehab financing up to 100%, sometimes maybe more. I kind of see bridges either with or without rehab financing, and I think to create value, you have to do the rehab. At Arbor, we're willing to lend on that rehab. Also, there's the prospect of buying lots, knocking them down, and then starting from scratch. So that's what we call uh, ground-up construction. Another hot topic with this conference seemed to be the technology. Greg, what interesting technology have you seen in the market that assists SFR portfolio acquisitions or dispositions? Probably the thing that I think is the coolest is artificial intelligence around condition. 
there are some technologies out there now that by virtue of a high resolution photograph, essentially, they're able to ascertain the condition of the property and put a moment in time. This is what I'm excited about. Condition of existing property is always an issue. There's always distressed property from a condition standpoint. That's just the nature of the beast, right? Every house in America, the paint dried out a little bit more since we've been sitting here, right? There's always deterioration going on. But understanding the condition, knowing what's going to happen when you pull something back, wasn't long ago that the title insurance industry had not yet taken all the microfiche and index cards and all the county clerk's offices in America and digitized them and gave us the big national housing database that is now the underpinning of everything we do in the real estate business and the lending business. The fact that every parcel in this country exists in a massive database. 25, 30 years ago, it didn't exist. Today, we sit here, and you can look up, you're probably used to this now, you look up an address on Zillow, the house is not available, but there's the pictures from the last time it was on the market, right? There's a photographic record that the MLSs have created that that over a couple of decades, more and more and more of a percentage of every house in this country had a photographic record taken of it that's now being retained. The technology is allowing companies that when they photograph properties, there is an assessment of the condition that is, you know, marginally accurate, will get dialed in and more and more accurate. I can see a time decades from now where a very high percentage of all the properties in this country It is known what condition they're in. It's known how long ago it was last renovated. From the standpoint of the usability, utility of that today, it's wonderful and it's obvious, but I think in terms of what does it mean when we know the condition or at least a date-stamped condition of of almost every single family home in this country that's now underway because of artificial intelligence. I think it's awesome. Steve, what prop tech is exciting you? So I want to come back to what Greg was saying. One of the struggles as the financial markets develop is the concept of the appraised value. The multifamily world does a brilliant job of assessing the value based on rent rolls, et cetera. The single family world is caught in this trap between comp sales, what it'd like home sell for, and trying to figure out how to employ an income approach. And frankly, even the borrowers come to us and the cost of these one appraisal at a time. It's painful, it takes time, and then you have to debate the end value. And as a lender, that becomes a struggle. Is there any technology you're seeing, Greg, that could help on the appraisal side? Because that would get borrowers very excited. Well, listen, they're dialing it in now, right? I mean, there's more and more and more history now in the database of where an automated valuation put a number on the property and the property sold. And so they were able to figure out if the AVM was right or wrong. These automated valuation models are utilizing comparable sales in a snapshot today, along with the actual sale of that exact parcel 11 years ago. So they're getting more and more sophisticated to the point now where I think we're almost at the point where an average of four AVMs is something that an investor will rely upon more than the opinion of a real estate broker. So the human element of valuation, I think, is getting hammered out of the process as the automated systems get smarter and smarter. Uh, And when the lending believes the robot more than the people, then that's perception equals reality. And Steve, do you see technology in the AI space in vendor management? The key to vendor management is data. You have to work with your vendor to understand what are the expectations, and then they have to be constantly revised so that you don't have the point that someone's lagging on rent increases, but the vendor didn't know it, and you didn't really know it either. But then you have this one portfolio out there and says, oh, wow. You know, look, like, how do you constantly stay on top? So you need centrally for your own employee, you need a taskmaster who really can dig through and process the data and understands the operational component to it, who has regular meetings. The way to manage the vendor is to manage the vendor. It's like the age old thing, but it's it, a lot of guys miss it. It's not just I'm going to pay my four, five, six, seven, eight percent of the rent roll, and let's see what happens. Is there technology that's helping with this staying on top of the vendors and the vendor management? Mobile technology is doing some really interesting things. Uber, as an analogy, is getting a little bit beat to death, but I want to use it anyway because it makes sense here. Vendor management, when you've got vendors in the field that you're not able to stand behind and watch what they're doing, the fact that you can have apps and they exist. I need to have a repair done. I've got vendors that are in the city who's closest to the repair right now. That's something we can know now. You want to have something repaired in your own home? The process is I make phone calls, I get responses, I schedule people to come and give me an estimate. They come, they leave. I had to wait four hours because they gave me a 9 to 12 window, right? Three hours. They send me the estimate. Now I schedule them again to come actually make the repair. I get a half a day window again. That real-time knowing where the actual technicians are 
which one is the closest and having the app be able to dispatch, not a human being doing it, an app dispatching the nearest person just by virtue of eliminating the first visit and having it all happen in the same visit. I'm nearby. I'm 20 minutes away. I'll come make the repair. They show up. That kind of technology that has the ability to identify the location of the vendor, the location of the property, and then dynamically match them. In that example, it cuts more than half of the pain out of it. Now, going around the room, Greg, Steve, then Brian, looking toward the future, where do you see the SFR market? There's a lot of careers being made. This is a place where professionals can be different than other people out there in the world. It's attracting a lot of innovation for that reason. And there are people who run straight into a place where they can break new ground. They're explorers, they're inventors. That's the kind of person they are. That's the kind of industry this is. So I think it's going to keep getting stronger. I think the largest operators are going to continue to lower their cost of capital. They'll continue to dominate at the top. But while they won't impact the mom and pop, the mom and pops will either exit the business profitably because they'll have upstream fish to sell to, or they will grow their portfolios and become slightly more sophisticated. In the mid-market, you're going to see the advent of technology, lower cost of capital. I think you're going to see better financing tools that allow operators to manage their portfolios, more flexible payment terms or prepayment terms. And then last but not least, I'd say the large public builders are going to get into the space. They've started. You've seen one or two names come in under max price guarantees, but you haven't really heard in an earnings announcement other than one that I can think of where they're in the build-to-rent space because the capital demand needs it. I think uh, there's just uh, plenty of opportunity out there. I think the SFR market in the non-bank lending stage is, is still in its uh, nascent stage. Society and younger folks, say the 30 to 50 demographic, they want mobility. They don't want all the chores that come with uh, owning the house. So I think rental demand is going to continue to grow. So going to be opportunities to become landlords and technology and lending opportunities will make that option uh, much easier. Well, thank you, Greg Rand, Chief Strategy Officer of Renters Warehouse, and Steve Katz, Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of Residential Financing, and Brian Murphy, Senior Vice President of Residential Financing, both with Arbor Realty Trust. We appreciate your insights from the IMN SFR Forum West, held in Scottsdale, Arizona. Thank you. Thanks for having me. To our listeners, thank you for joining us. For more coverage of the IMN's Single Family Rental Conference, please check out the Arbor website at arbor.com.